Great. So um, before we do that, um, if you've got any questions, ask away. Just use the Q&A uh, button on the bottom of the screen and we'll answer, answer them uh, during the webinar. Uh, if you've got, got any comments as well, just use the, the, the chat. Uh, if you miss anything, don't worry. You can watch the whole thing back afterwards on our website. Um, I think uh, that's pretty much it. Um, I'll just see if I, my second screen just broke about 10 minutes ago. Can you believe it? I've been oh, so no. set up here with two screens. So I might not be able to see all the questions, but I think you are going to keep a tab on that, aren't you? I will keep an eye on, on questions and uh, read them out. Uh, but before we go anywhere, uh, perhaps Monica, you can give us just a short intro of um, uh, who you are and what you do. Sure. I'll try to keep it short, but um, um, yeah, <laughs> I've included a few images as well to show you just a bit of uh, what type of work I do. But um, to keep it as short as I possibly can with my very many hats, um, I work primarily as a photographer and a visual artist. Uh, and I also lecture at a couple of different universities, primarily in London. It's, uh, it's for London College of Communication. Uh, I also run short courses in photography, evening courses. Now, obviously, in these corona times, I've even started doing online masterclasses. Um, and in the past, uh, I've also been co-director and managing director for Renaissance Photography Prize. I don't know if anyone's heard of that one. Um, and for that prize, I would, for example, also edit a catalog and exhibitions, uh, curate exhibitions. So that will be one of the things I'll mention later on as well. And then I've also worked um, as an art consultant and also an editor in a photography journal. So hopefully I'll have some, um, some experience from then editing other people's work as well as my own to, to share with you. And then yeah. I'll, I'll quickly show you some of my um, photography that I do it as well, just so you get a, a sense of that. I think we have time. We have an hour. We have time. So, um, well, that's just my intro screen. But if anyone wants to make a note of my website and see some more work, you can, of course, do, do that. I'll have this later on as well if you, if you want to see that later on. Um, I won't talk a lot about these works, but do feel free to send me an email or anything. If you do have questions about, about the work, I'd be very, very happy to speak about it. But this is one of my most recent bodies of work called The Way of Flowers, where I've examined um, uh, the, the language of flowers in relation to Ikebana and uh, kind of compositions in photography. So I'll just quickly show you some of these. And I do quite a lot of exhibitions as well. This one was from a, a small solo show that I had in Tokyo last year. Um, and obviously as well, when we're thinking of curating, which I'll come back to a bit later as well, it's quite interesting in terms of obviously when you're editing your own work to if you're working with other people's work and also obviously the purpose of what you're editing it for. Um, when you're in a solo show, for example, you have maybe much more space to spread around your work. It's very, very different from if you're in a group show and how to make a group show look good, for example. This is just from another body of work, so I'll quickly show you. Uh, this was again from um, uh, an exhibition that I did when I was lucky enough to be a, uh, in a year long artist residency in 2017 in Watts Gallery. And I developed this series called Fieldworks and Other Landscape Stories. And again from, from the solo show that belonged to that residency. And I don't do just photography, I do sometimes also uh, sound art and installation and uh, recently also I've made uh, a few short films. But obviously today we'll be speaking only about photography. And of course, um, I won't cover this too much today, um, but if you're interested uh, further in exploring also, for example, how to present your work and how to exhibit your work, that's something that maybe we could send out a bit more info on in terms of when I'll, for example, have some 
some other online masterclasses on that. Um, but it is, of course, very, very interesting to consider how we actually exhibit our work as well in terms of uh, how things work, not necessarily just on, um, on a white wall or on a white page, but actually thinking about the spaces in as well. So anyway, so, enough about me. Yeah, so with, with editing, when we started planning this webinar, and I mentioned it to, to a photographer who I think is on this call, and he said, that's brilliant, editing is always such a nightmare. Um, why yeah. is that? <laughs> I think this is a good question. I, I love editing, so I don't know <laughs> why it's a nightmare. But what I think it is, is that obviously we photographers are very, very good at looking at individual images because that's what we do when we shoot. Uh, and I think sometimes maybe it's hard to put them in, in context or in series. And especially sometimes also it could be hard to, to manage to edit out. If, if we really like images, we, we tend to keep them in, but actually that a series or a book or a portfolio could sometimes be better if we took five of them out. So I think it's, it's maybe to do with that, looking at singular images as opposed to, to a series, but you know, hopefully you'll be a little bit wiser at the end of the call, but, but yeah, I know it's a tricky, a tricky thing for, for us photographers. Um, but I thought we'll, we'll divide it into three today and obviously in three sections, sorry. Um, and obviously feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, we love questions and um, we, can, we can kind of answer them as we go along as well, rather than saving them all to, till the end. So feel free to, to ask at any point. So we'll speak about um, editing in general and then also a little bit about considerations for making a portfolio and also considerations for having photo books, uh, or sorry, photographs in a photo book. So let's get started. Yeah. If my computer collaborates, let's see. There we go. Um, so in terms of editing, I just wanted to kind of clarify a bit what I mean by editing. So um, I tend to use that word about two different types of working with images. One is a kind of, you know, when you do your image adjustment. So when you've shot and you're working on one-on-one -on -one image, maybe to adjust the contrast or to adjust the, uh, the color balance, the white balance, something like that. And that's not really the type of editing I'll be focusing on today. Today, we're more speaking about what tends to be the trickiest part for photographers. As I said, it's about maybe editing down from a bigger shoot or from um, editing together when you've got it down from say 300 down to 20, what then do you do with the 20? How, in which order do they go? Uh, what size do they go, for example? Uh, and what, what do they work next to? So that's, that's the type of editing I want to focus on today. And it's obviously, it's hugely important because it can actually really make a difference in terms of how your work is being seen, because what can look like a fairly kind of chaotic and not thought through project, by reordering things and really, really thinking about what fits together, you can, you know, you can in a way enhance the entire project. And very often as well, when I look at, uh, for example, if I help students with editing their work, very often we look at their final images that they've kind of chosen and they're going to hand in. And we realized actually, if you look back at the contact sheets or obviously in newer days, now we're looking at Lightroom catalogs and things like that we can see that it's not necessarily always the strongest images that have been chosen. So I think again, we photographers have a tendency to that, to do that where we sometimes skip some of the strongest work and we pick something else, uh, you know, maybe an image that's a bit weaker as the final. Um, I assume I would get a question on, how do you just become good at editing? <laughs> um, so in case you're wondering, I would say it's, it's not, you know, it's not like click off a finger, all of a sudden you're good at it. It's not necessarily that we're bad at it either. But I think it's a combination of, you know, getting a bit of advice and education on it, not necessarily formal education, but just someone who, who knows a lot about it might be able to give you some advice. Uh, some have a natural talent for it. They just kind of see what goes together. Um, and obviously as well, I would maybe also say it's, it's very much to do with experience. If you've edited thousands of images, you'll start to get the hang of it. So I'm sure a lot of you on this call as well are photographers, and I'm sure you have edited thousands of images. So maybe you are already quite, quite good at this. And of course, I think it's important as well to get feedback on an edit. 
and just hearing other people's point of view i think that's really really important so you know make an edit and share it with people and see see what they think um and this was well no major thing to say uh for this slide but i just wanted to say that um obviously some of you might be editing on contact sheets and kind of sifting through loads and loads of negatives or um, images on a contact sheet. Um, but one thing that I really love using in Lightroom as well is this, you know, the compare view where you can see two, two images. Uh, not that this one is a great example, but I think it can really, really make a difference when you look at, for example, two portraits or two landscapes or whatever it is, and you study them next to each other. So you can really, really see the nuances and why one composition might be slightly better than the other. So that's, that's one to keep in mind as well. Um, and sometimes also when I edit, and then this comes into a, a bit of the kind of principles of editing that I'll speak about in a, in a bit. Very often I use just Finder on my computer and I just rejig the icons of the images, the little thumbnails, until I get them in an okay order. So here I've just taken a random, you know, selection of photographs and then I've just had a play about with them and kind of categorized them a bit more into what can kind of flow in a slightly nicer way. So I've kind of separated them out to like three different pieces, taken away a couple and kind of matched some of them up that are kind of taken in a similar light and similar, similar color. So sometimes it, uh, it's not always it's not even about the kind of professional software or anything it's it's about just looking at the images whether they're thumbnails on a screen or whether they're tiny tiny prints that you scatter out on your table and you just have a look at what works next to to each other so that's one thing that i'd say is maybe a principle is just have a feel for uh, for what works without any kind of prior knowledge or fancy software And then um, I thought I'll say a bit about what I would think of as what could often make good edits. Um, one thing to look at is often, for example, the actual content in the images. So for example, here, uh, if you see on the one on the left, obviously Martin Pass um, book Luxury, the images are often taken in different locations. But for example, here, the editors often match them in a way together but in a quite subtle way. So it's just this kind of the use of the hats on the left or the use of basically something like the cigar on the one on the right. But it's not really about that. It's about the atmosphere in the image. It's about the composition. It's about you observing the event that's going on. But it's these subtle things that often connect the images on the, on the pages. I also quite like how he's using the, the space here or the editor is using the space here in terms of also kind of landscapes and portrait format images are working quite well together just by, uh, by using it in a kind of square format and actually moving it through, uh, uh, around so that it fits kind of regardless and leaving that kind of white space on the inner side as well. But anyway, I'll get carried away on photo books. So I'll come back to that later. Um, color is a type of um, editing. This is just an example from Sophie Cal's really, really funny project where she photographed loads of um, meals, all color coordinated. So obviously I don't mean that you should necessarily go to this extreme, uh, but what I mean is that sometimes uh, it can be worth looking at the color of images when you edit things together. Now, what I mean by that is don't necessarily match everything up that is in color. Sometimes that just doesn't work. It can actually look a bit too obviously curated or too obviously edited. But I think it could be worth sometimes looking at the, the tone of color um, and maybe making that flow a bit. So it goes maybe from warmer to, to colder instead of thinking, oh, I'm gonna put all the green images in one side of my portfolio. Um, so one good example of that, I think, is from Jo Metzen Scott and her book, The Gray Line. Um, I love how she's using the word, the gray line, um, the word gray, sorry, to kind of run through her, her book, I feel. So her cover is gray and also her images, even though they're color, they're quite desaturated throughout. 
So for example, here as well, you can see a bit what I mean about the, the images are in a way the same color, even though they're different locations, they're of different people, different interviews. Um, they're not necessarily all green, but they have the same tone. So they kind of flow together, they fit together in the book. And she's playing obviously on her title as well with the, with the gray line. Do stop me, Toby, if, I, uh, if you have questions or if I'm going too fast. That's fine. Um, another thing as well is playing with scale. I would say that could be quite a good principle of, of editing as well. Keeping, keeping in mind kind of close up versus going further away. Uh, or looking at other contrasts like that as well. That can often work when you edit your body of work. Now, obviously, this depends on what type of work you do. If all your work is macro photography, it's obviously, you know, don't listen to me about this. It really, really depends what type of photography you do. Uh, but I'm, for example, thinking in terms of my experience working with editorial photography or curating exhibitions, I find myself often wanting to pair together things that might be looking at things that, from different point of views. So that it's not all the same unless of course you need it to be all the same. It again, depends on your series of work. Um, and just coming back to the photography prize that I mentioned earlier, so Renaissance Photography Prize. This is again, one of the uh, kind of typical challenge, I think for uh, a curator. Um, so for these annual exhibitions, we had around 60 images framed to fit into one space by something like in the last year, I think it was 47 photographers. So some of them had submitted series. So you can imagine 60 images, basically a group show. Some have similar themes, some have similar styles, but basically they don't match. So this is obviously one of the challenges that I love because it's about making what could become an insanely messy exhibition flow throughout the space. Um, so I hope that I did it quite well. I'll at least mention it as an example uh, of how I think when I do this. Um, and it's very much to, to, instead of again, kind of grouping things by color or you know, putting all the black and white together in one corner, I, I like to play with it much more where you, um, where you might see some similarities or contrast in the work that work together. Um, and also, I think instead of working with the, the group show in a very much a kind of segmented way where everyone needs to have their own little separate space, I think it could be quite interesting, like, like these two images in the middle of just, you know, letting them kind of connect, but they're facing away from each other. But they're, again, they're kind of, instead of just hanging next to each other, they, they kind of have a little kind of visual, visual dialogue. So it could be things like that. Obviously some, um, some works could sometimes be more similar. So again, for my work as well, like for example, the, the photos I showed you of flowers in a vase, they're not that vastly different from each other. I can't do that much more, you know, that much to the editing. It's going to be a row of flowers in a vase. Um, but again, if, if it's more that you're dealing with many different things in a project, then I think it's about that flow where you might take some that are closer up, some that are further away, uh, some maybe portraits where one is close, one is from a different angle and somehow they flow. I hope that makes sense. That's just another example as well of very, very different work that we then try to uh, to fit together. Like even here, for example, is, is maybe more the, the theme and the movement. Um, and then the top one, obviously, with the, with the border, the Mexico-US border. And whereas here as well, I feel it's, it's almost like a border, even though this is a very different image and a very different theme by a very different photographer. Um, and as I said as well, I often think of editing in terms of, for example, editorial photography as well. So if you're shooting, for example, a story, it's very much about telling that story and seeing how that story flows through the images. You know, is there a narrative? 
Uh, does it go from kind of start to finish in a chronological way? Uh, are you illustrating things that need to be kind of some details, some portraits in order to show uh, the story of, you know, a, let's say a startup business that you're photographing or something. So that's a very different type of editing, I think, to, to curating. So again, maybe connecting by uh, space in the image and also content in the image. So for example, these two images fit quite, quite nicely. They're in completely different places, but I've just shot them in a way that it has a bit of space above their heads. You know, they're both sitting on a bar stool. You know, they both look a bit like hipsters here, but they kind of, you know, they work together, even if they're two completely different, different places. But then of course, the next images might be kind of close up of coffee cups. So this was for a Drift magazine. So it was a coffee, coffee magazine. So then you have close-ups of coffee cups, uh, maybe some more kind of um, exterior or interior of the place I was in, and then a series of, of portraits. So it kind of varies throughout. So uh, quick question for you, Monica. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with decisions in life, I don't know about you, but I like to sleep on things. But, you know, how can we approach things if we, we're in a rush and we need to edit something? How do we think, um, of, how do we approach that? Gut instinct, I think. So for example, those little images that I showed you, the little thumbnails of, I just did them in, you know, three minutes before the, before the call. So I think sometimes you just have to follow gut instinct when you obviously you have principles maybe in your mind that you've learned and that you've experienced. But then when it comes to the actual, actual decision, I think you just, you put things together and you go a bit by gut instinct of this works, you know? It's a bit like when you hear a song that you really like, it just, it has a good melody. It has a good kind of, it goes, I don't know, I don't know, it could be that it's catchy or it has a, you know, a beautiful calm melody, but it's something about it that you know that it's kind of, is made in a good way. So I think, yeah, complicated answer maybe, <laughs> but, <laughs> Yeah, listen to gut instinct. Yeah. And a bit of knowledge. Um, but yeah, um, don't need to say a lot about this, but this was again just about editorial photography because often, obviously, uh, sometimes when you shoot editorially, you lose control over what's being edited where um, once it goes to the editor of the magazine. So that's one thing to bear in mind as well as that maybe... Um, you know, I'd, I'd be thinking a bit about what, what kind of images or what kind of set of images I'd supply so that the editor as well has that choice of, um, of kind of like portrait format, landscape format, something a bit further away, something closer up. With portraiture, I like to kind of have a mix as well of, of something where, they, you know, they're looking in the camera or maybe they're not looking in the camera. But then again, you're giving yourself and the editor choice in this as well. So obviously, I don't know the, um, the audience on this uh, on this webinar um, because, of course, you could be working with you know purely personal projects, fine arts only for potential exhibitions. Um, you could be a student starting out. You could be uh, making a portfolio. You could be a, you know have thirty years experience with editorial photography. Um, but I hope that it makes sense to you and that it's useful in in some way. I think a reminder is always good. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is just another example of where editorial work has been edited very much to do with tonality. So again, you can imagine here from um, a long kind of investigation um, reportage that I did, I would have handed in to the editor a lot of work. Um, but obviously then they start also grouping together what works in terms of, for example, here, the, the, the tonality of the blues in this, in this set of images. And here as well, I quite like that juxtaposition between, you know, the guy facing away um, and then all the other people also kind of doing the same as this, this person with the binoculars. Um, but in a you know very kind of randomized relaxed manner and much further away as well so it kind of works i like sometimes these kind of the back kind of breaking these principles 
um, that people should always be facing each other. I think it's quite interesting sometimes to just turn things around. It's the, it's the best things with rules, you know, learn them properly and then learn how to, to break them. Absolutely. Break the rules. <laughs> yeah, break the rules. So to sum up my advice on kind of, you know, uh, editing in general, I would say that less is more sometimes. Again, depends on your work. Um, but I think, again, we photographers have a tendency to include too much. The next one, and I see this very often, kill your darlings. So what I mean by that is sometimes it's the first and your favorite image that somehow just doesn't fit in. So sometimes even the favorite image would have to go if it just doesn't make sense in what you're trying to do. Uh, it could be in an exhibition, it could be in your portfolio, it could be in a set of images. Third, there's no shame in seeking help. So it's absolutely okay to get a bit of feedback, send your work to other people and get them to feedback. I've done that so many times and it really helps to get other people's opinion as well. If your gut instinct is failing you, then maybe they could tell you that, no, these don't work. Or what if you put this one here and then all of a sudden it works. Um, and the, the last one, maybe then to, to think about this, what I said about near and far, maybe look for these kind of contrasts or similarities that could sometimes make, you know, the magic happen uh, in a set of images. Shall I go on to portfolio? So do you have any questions, Toby? Portfolios. There are no questions right now, so carry on. Okay. I do hope you guys ask questions and we will be happy to take them at any point. Um, so for portfolios, I don't have a lot of uh, slides to show you because I think, again, that's so personal. Um, so I don't necessarily have loads of examples. Um, but I've, I've run quite a lot of uh, portfolio reviews. I've both also had them, obviously, as an artist and conducted them and looked at other people's portfolios. So I've been on kind of all sides of the table on that. Um, and what I often see in, you know, especially then when I organize them or when I conduct them, is that um, sometimes people come either with just way too much work um, so that would be one thing I would, I would say is maybe, maybe think there as well that less is more. Because often if you have, for example, a portfolio review, you might just run out of time and you've only spoken about, you know, a third of your portfolio. So that's one thing to, to think about there as a con kind of consideration for portfolio is if you feel you, you don't have enough work, think about how long would it take you to talk about it all. And if you can't really do that in 20 minutes, then you probably have too much work in there. So I would say maybe a, a good guide that, again, that I often say to students or, or people that I mentor is maybe try to think no more than like 15, 20 images. I think that's a good number in a portfolio. Um, or if you work in kind of more bodies of work, like I often do, then maybe three, four bodies of work maximum. So would you cut it down with like amount of images or would you cut it down like for your project or? Sometimes uh, I would say either because sometimes I think cutting it down by type or, or the project as well can, can really help because um, you might be showing it to slightly different people. So for some, it might be more relevant to show more of, you know, the black and white stuff from 2009 because that's a bit more like that gallery style. Um, whereas maybe for others, it might be more about showing um, a kind of breadth of stuff that you do. So I think, again, that that depends. But again, if you come back to and, and keep thinking that of like less is more and, and kill your darlings, you might just see that even in all your work of 40 images, you might just be able to take out a couple from each series and still have just a strong uh, portfolio. Yeah. OK, so there's a question here about uh, asking approximately how many images per project if it's three or four projects so i'm guessing we're in a portfolio review situation here um well yeah i almost think regardless whether it's portfolio review or whether you're sending it to someone um i think i would still maybe try to keep the total amount of images to about maximum 20. so again four projects then maybe five five in each each if we do some simple maths um, I think that that makes sense. 
because again then if you work in bodies of work you might have more to say about the actual project and maybe you don't need as many images as an example from it um, and you leave them wanting more of course <laughs> um but of course if it's more that you're showing these are my portraits for doing a portrait job then you might want to have quite a lot of good portraits but they're not necessarily in a um in a, a specific body of work or from a specific project it might actually then if you work more editorially or commercially it might be worth organizing it in terms of maybe the genre of work or uh, the visual style of the work instead so i hope that answers there's no, there's no uh, specific answer, of course, and you could have however many images you want. But again, from experience, yeah, just don't, don't go way over 20 because you just won't have, you will lose the attention often of the person looking at it as well, whether they're looking at their laptop or whether they're uh, in a portfolio review. Um, so there we have it, between 12 to 20 images. <laughs> um, less is more. Um, and with this, I would say all the time, as opposed to um, some of the time, because again, what, what I keep coming back to here is often someone looking at a portfolio review is limited to time. Sorry, looking at the portfolio is limited to time. Whereas, of course, if it's um, in a photo book or in an editorial article, it's not necessarily that it fits your work to have less. I would also say a good advice here would be to start and end with your strongest piece. Um, it's not that you're working between that isn't good, but I think it's about also leaving a bit of an impression when people open the portfolio and start, uh, gives you something to talk about, uh, but also that you end with something that you feel, okay, they're going to remember this image. So I think that's a good, uh, good thing to keep in mind as well. And as I mentioned already, I'm um, repeating myself here, but maybe arrange them by project or genre or visual style. And I would also make a consideration to think about title or text if you're not there in person to talk about your work. So if you're sending it on email to someone, um, they might think, oh, what are these random images? Whereas actually, if you have a bit of a title or, or text or something, it might make much more sense for, for someone who's never seen your work before. Um, so, so make like a nice looking PDF with some text in it or something. Yeah, I would often, you know, I could have a whole a whole session just on making portfolios, but um, you can make it quite a simple PDF. You could use InDesign. You can make it uh, into a, you know, online by uploading that PDF or by by making a website specifically for viewing portfolios. So something that maybe you give a password to that only some clients can see, for example. And keep modifying it as well, I think. Like it might, depending again, of course, of what type of work you do. Um, if you're an artist, you tend maybe not to swap around your work all the time because the work stays the same regardless of who looks at it. But if maybe you're an editorial photographer, maybe then you have to change it because it depends on the style of the magazine you're showing it to, for example. And then I thought we'll speak a bit about photo books as well. Um, that's something I, I teach a lot about and um, I'm quite passionate about photo books. I've only made a couple of uh, artist publications myself, but I've edited a lot of other people's work. Uh, and um, in some of the university projects that I teach as well, we often get students to make photo books and we get amazing, amazing results. It's so much fun to work with. So I thought we'll speak a bit about that as well, just in case any of you are interested in going down this route or maybe some of you have published photo books before but i think it's really really interesting to think then about how images flow throughout a book because obviously here with photo books the intentions of it are completely different from a portfolio it's not about showcasing all your skills it's about presenting one one project often in the best possible way that also then makes sense within the kind of parameters and the framework of a book So considerations to make with that, obviously apart from making a really, really good project that could work in a photo book, could be things like how the visual choices that you make within the layout can then all of a sudden uh, impact how people see your work. So 
if your work is a bit in your face and you want it a bit in people's face, then for example, full bleed works really, really well. Or if something is very detailed and you, you need it to be very close up, so get it as big as possible and have it full bleed. This is from uh, Richard Billingham's work, Raise a Laugh. I'll just show you some examples as we go through as well, because it's, I think one of the best ways to learn about photo books is to also examine and learn about kind of the history of photo books and looking at lots of contemporary photo books. Oh, this one is a bit pixelated, but um, Rinko Kawauchi's um, uh, book Illuminance, I think is a really interesting ex example as well of when we're looking at space, but also how images work together on a, on a page or on a double page spread. Um, being, you know, having white space as opposed to the full bleed um, is really something, again, not to be scared of. I think sometimes giving that space helps with that kind of poetry throughout the book of just giving the viewer a better breathing space and giving the images a better breathing space. So space is an important consideration as well, I think. Um, obviously, again, text is an important consideration. But another thing as well is maybe that space where you're actually maybe designing your, your layout of your book a bit more like a portfolio. So you don't necessarily have to have that interaction that we saw on the other page, but with, between the two images, but more actually showing one and one image so that the viewer concentrates on one thing at a time. But I think if you work in a uh, book format, you kind of have to take into consideration the fact that you're working with two pages that are opposite each other. So I think being aware of that, you, you know, you can use it to your benefits. And I see often editors work with this in quite a humorous way where images often kind of play off each other on the two different pages. So where there might be like similar movements or contrasting movements, uh, even here there's like um, both obviously a landscape picture and a portrait format picture that normally sometimes, you know, I don't feel they even go together because it's a bit annoying when they're in different formats. But here it just flows nicely from this long sofa to this portrait of, of these kind of hugging couples. And here as well, I think is another good example of uh, how kind of movements within the image, so the content within the image uh, can play off each other or mirror each other on, on the pages. I think that's again one of the advantages of working with a book is that you can work with two and two, so you can work in pairs. So some uh, general advice, I guess, on photo books. This is again very, very brief. Um, you know, again, I could speak about this for hours, but just some of my advice for this would be to start with a flat plan. Um, and what I mean by that, if, you're, if you've not heard that term before, what I mean by that is it's almost a bit like a contact sheet, but where you draw up little squares and you can do it by hand or on uh, a grid on the computer and you just plan out uh, what goes where in the book. And it's so, so helpful when you then start designing or if you're communicating with the designer about again communicating the flow of the images. So you might have already a kind of narrative in mind of where things need to go, uh, or you might have some design, uh, design choices or specific text that need to go here and there, um, space choices, all these things. So having that mapped out on a flat plan makes it also then much easier for you when you kind of start designing this. I'd say about images, if unsure, take it out. So again, it comes back to this kind of gut instinct. I think if you look through, um, it's a bit like when you read a text that you've written, uh, if one sentence doesn't sound quite right, it needs to be edited. Um, I'm reading a lot of dissertations at the moment for students. Um, and it's a bit the same with images. If you look at it and you think, mm, not quite right, I would maybe then advise maybe, maybe take it out because there's maybe a reason why you kind of pause and feel that image doesn't fit in as, as well. Um, I'd also say consider the space. So like I showed with the Rinko Kawauchi um, page, or there's obviously loads of other good examples of this where there's loads of space around the images. They might be quite small on the, on the page, just again, give the kind of opposite emphasis to having a full bleed. 
Um, and that space is quite important to get right as well. And then obviously think about the, the narrative, if there is a narrative and how it works, because obviously a book works often from, from front to back. So unless you're thinking everything in pairs, it's very much about the kind of start to finish. Um, a lot of photographers can work with that in a kind of chronological way or light, you know, going from light to dark, or you just think about the kind of story unfolding uh, or just generally kind of how it flows from, from start to finish. What would you say are like the biggest pitfalls or maybe mistakes that, mistake, if we can call them mistakes, you know, that, that people make when editing books? Um, a good one that I often see um, is, is that because we're so used to editing it on a screen, sometimes then when it's printed out, you realize that actually the text is humongous. <laughs> So you might have sat on a small laptop screen and put in some dainty little text under images, but then you, you know, you print it out on an A3 book and it's absolutely massive. So that's one thing is to kind of make test prints and check that the sizes are, are right. I think also, of course, um, sometimes you notice that it doesn't flow quite right. It might look a bit messy. Um, and maybe again, also with maybe including too much. But to be honest, also, I see, you know, hundreds of really, really good photo books. So often, again, it's gone through many stages of editing by the time it gets printed. So it's often OK. Um, but yeah, I think that's maybe the, the text thing is, uh, can, can be a big one or not quite choosing the right format. Or, of course, not that we have time to cover it in this one, but learning a bit about fonts as well can be good for us, I think. Um, you know, you don't necessarily want Comic Sans font all through your, your book. That's <laughs> obviously doing it on purpose. Hipster Comic Sans. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope that makes sense. Oh, it's not the end of the webinar, but it's the end of my uh, slides anyway. So we can pause on that one <laughs> and see if any of you have got um, any questions. That's a question popping up um, how do you deal with prints of different sizes for hanging together for exhibition oh well I think it's more fun when they're different sizes sometimes because I think even when they're the same size I don't necessarily always create it in in one line I think playing with scale is um, is really interesting and I think the choice obviously has to be made before you print it in terms of which one would you give emphasis of being smaller and larger and why maybe it's good to think about why you're you're printing them smaller or larger um you know is one of them more a main image for example then maybe hang that more at eye level and some that are more supplementary or for some reason printed smaller maybe they could be at a slightly lower or slightly higher level you know that's just one of the places where maybe i would start looking at them of not necessarily all be at the same eye level, but maybe mixing them together a bit. Um, maybe and one of the mistakes we often do there actually is not quite aligning things, because even when we have this kind of grid hanging, a lot of lines are still aligned in order to make it look decent so it doesn't look completely um, messy. So it could be worth also think, thinking about that when you mix a lot of work is just make sure at least there's some kind of gravity there of something matching up. Keeping it balanced. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think all this, like my entire um, talk so far today is about harmony and balance, really. Or, of course, about shaking that up if your work is, is, is not about harmony. So on, on the question that we had about uh, sort of different sizes and, and the things in exhibition, does... Uh, things like scale play into that. I'm thinking scale of what's actually been photographed, you know, is it a massive hill compared to a, a, a person or, you know, how far away are things, etc. Yeah, sometimes. I, I think, for example, that, um, I don't know if you remember, but in the, in the start here, when I showed you some of the images uh, that were suspended down from the ceiling, that were hanging, the portraits that were hanging in a, in a big kind of factory gallery space. Um, with that, I wanted them almost life-size because it was a bit about kind of meeting someone and almost seeing like 
as if you're meeting yourself at the door, you know, you're kind of, you're faced with someone. So they had to be quite uh, life size or, or a larger scale. Um, and I also sometimes think it's about maybe the scale you're in. Uh, maybe in a massive space, you might think massive prints. And we've done that. I've created exhibition with four meter long prints because we're in a massive warehouse. But sometimes also it can be really interesting then to go into, if you photographed marbles on a table, maybe print them tiny and make people go up to it to, to look at it. Great. So there's another question here. Uh, which says, speaking about storytelling, what advice for telling a powerful story? Hmm. Well, I think maybe the first thing would be to think about that the story in itself is powerful. Um, and I know that sounds a bit maybe silly because it really depends again on what the work is. But I think if you've got a good story in that whatever you're photographing is interesting, then I think that will help. And then I think really, really thinking about kind of the, the basics of photography, but lighting and composition and really highlighting what you need to say. So if it's um, a portrait of um, a 90 year old lady who's lost her husband, then maybe think about intimate portraits, subtle lighting, uh, being a bit kind of up close, a bit of details and making it quite, you know, empathetic with the story you're telling. And if it's about speed racing in France, then maybe, you know, it's all about capturing the energy really. So again, it really, really depends on what you're, you're photographing. Again, maybe there it's a bit of gut instinct to whatever is right for the project that you're working on. All right, we've got a couple more questions here. Uh, one is asking, do you have a favorite photo book that's brilliantly edited? Oh, I have too many. Um, oh my God. In, in terms of like, you know, photography history and all, we have so many, um, Ed Rushka's, uh, 26 gas stations, for example, is brilliant. It's a concertina fallout book. I wanted to include an image of that and I just ran out of time here. Um, but um, those are things that I would speak about in more in-depth classes as well, because then we look a bit at this photo history of where sometimes these conceptual photo books have come from as well, uh, where it might not always be to do with the image quality, but about the, the whole concept behind the works. That one is, is uh, a funny one. Um, I think also Illuminance, for example, by Rinko Kawauchi. Um, the, the examples that I, I showed really are, are books that I really like, but for different reasons. And I think uh, if, if, you really, if you're interested in seeing more photo books, it might be worth checking out some photo publishers like um, um, Dewey Lewis, MacBooks, Self Published Be Happy, uh, all these where you can just see loads and loads of examples of, of good photo books. But yeah, I struggle to say just one. Yeah. Okay, so we got someone here who's interested in producing pamphlets rather than books. Mm -hmm. And he's asking if you have any advice for editing a pamphlet. Uh, what do you think would be the minimum number of images to include? Well, that depends what it's for. Because I would think a pamphlet as a scene or as a kind of newspaper, or is it a brochure for a project? Depends what it is. So I, I feel there, I can't really give a rule of how many it should be because again, it depends on, on what it is. It could technically work with only two if it's a folded object where, you know, you might have one massive one and then a bit of text and another one and it's folded in a clever way. So, you know, it could be as few as two, but again, maybe it depends on, on the story and the purpose of the pamphlet as well, but maybe you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, okay. So we might get another comment on that question, but uh, meanwhile, there's a question, would you ever go back and re-edit re an edit or a second look or after some time? Yeah, that I actually think is a very good point. Um, very often I will do, because we often work to deadlines, right? So you often do uh, a fairly fast uh, edit that you're quite confident with. And then actually when you look at it a month later, you realize maybe you should have done something different. So it could be a good advice. So thank you for, for that. I could be that you basically give everyone a good advice to maybe edit everything two days before you have to hand it in 
get a bit of a perspective on it and look at it again. And maybe then you can make some even better choices. But I guess it could also be that, you know, you revisit a project you did for a magazine and then you do a, a very different edit when you, when you do it for your website a month later. Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's about um, the aim of it or the output of it. So that could be very, very different. Um, and of course, obviously then complete different choices in, in images and different uses for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can't see any more questions coming in. Oh, sorry. Uh, there is one more. In a portfolio, would you mix, uh, would you mix frame and dimension sizes? Um, in terms of information about it or in terms of that they would all be printed the same size? Because what I'm imagining here is maybe your work would be very different scale and you're asking about whether it would be represented all at the same size. Then maybe my answer would be, yes, I would maybe mix it uh, because some of my work as well doesn't just work as, as 2D work. Some of my works are um more like 3d framed boxes so the dimensions of them are quite important so in the more fine art portfolio i would maybe write the dimensions underneath if it's important for the people looking at it but yeah i think you can mix it maybe then just make it make it clear okay and there's another one here in a portfolio could you have landscapes with street photography with portraits absolutely but again, it depends who you're showing it to. Um, because maybe if, if it's for a very kind of general purpose of, of saying these are all the kind of stuff I, I can do that I, that I work with to show a range, then maybe okay. If not, maybe I would have uh, one that you at least emphasize on. So you say, I do mostly street photography. I'm showing it to you as a street photographer editor of something or whatever it is that you want to, to submit it to or show it to. And then maybe it's a subsection or a smaller part towards the end where you might say also that you also have a passion for landscape photography, for example. Or of course, if it's in one body of work, it very often works with landscape and portrait, for example. So maybe I would say absolutely fine to mix, but just don't mix too much because I think it could get very, very confusing for the, the people looking at it in terms of what, what stuff you do and what your intention is in terms of what work you, you'd like to do. So is it fair to say that if you mix different projects, different visual styles and, and different type of you know, landscape or street photography all in one, it can get a bit messy? It can get a bit confusing, I think, yeah. It can look good when it's messy, but it can just also just look a bit like you didn't make any kind of editing choices. So then I think it could be better to make harder choices, but have uh, saved those good photos that you might take out of one portfolio and put them back in into another. And yeah, of, of course, some, some people have different portfolios for, you know, they might have a wedding portfolio uh, for their wedding photography website, and then they have a different portfolio for their, the rest of their work, so. Exactly. Yeah, because a lot of photographers work obviously with uh, personal projects or fine art projects or whatever we'll, we'll call them, but art-based art practice. Uh, but in addition, maybe do commercial work, editorial work, wedding, baby photography or product photography. And of course, you need to, to cater to, to different types. All right. So now I don't see any more questions. Um... So I think we're going to wrap it up. It's been about an hour as well. So not bad on the timing. That's good. Uh, don't forget, you can go back and rewatch it if you want to uh, write down any of the titles of the books mentioned and things like that. Um, you can do that. Thanks very much for watching. And thanks, Monica, for joining us. Thank you very much. And thank All you right. to the audience. All right. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thanks, guys. <laughs>